Our scripture reading is from Mark chapter 1, 9 through 13. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart by the Spirit, and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. And the Spirit immediately drove him out, of the, out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness forty days, tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beast, and the angels waited on him. Please be seated. This past Wednesday was Ash Wednesday, and many of you were here for our Ash Wednesday service as it was a time for us to kick off the Lenten season. And during this time of Lent, it is 40 days leading up to Easter. And it's a time of self-examination and a time of devoting ourselves to the Lord and just preparing our hearts so that when Easter comes, that we are really ready to understand and really experience all that that Easter involves. Yeah, I know for some of you, you've decided for Lent that maybe you're going to give up something, and maybe that's giving up sweets or Cokes or watching TV or something like that. You know, it's whatever you choose to do if you choose to do it. It's, it's not meant as a punishment. It's actually meant as something so that whenever you start to reach for that, that item or that thing, that you stop and think, no, I'm going to focus on Jesus instead. Or instead of giving up, you may decide you want to take up something. And taking up may be to spend more time in prayer. Or maybe it's to, to read your Bible a little bit more. To do a daily devotion. And whether you give up or take up, it's a chance to look up. Because in any of these cases, it's totally up to you. It's not something that's legalistically required or anything. But it's just a chance for us to devote ourselves to the Lord and just to be in preparation during this time so that we're better able to, to receive all that Christ has for us. I will tell you that during this Lenten season, our entire church is going to be on a journey together. We're going to be doing a Bible study, and it's for children and youth and adults, and we're following a Bible study called The Way, Following in the Footsteps of Jesus. And so in our Sunday school classes, and I believe in the UMW and the different things, we'll be looking at this, and the sermons will be coming from this as well. So we will be journeying, journeying on with Jesus, looking at his entire life, and then you know, end up at the end of this season, uh, we'll end up on Good Friday at the cross, and then three days later at the empty tomb for his resurrection and, and time of celebration. So you've just heard Lindsay read to us, from Mark, the Gospel of Mark, uh, the first chapter, about Jesus' baptism and his temptation. And that's the portion that we're covering today. Actually, the Gospel of Mark begins talking about John. And John is Jesus' cousin. And you probably best know John as either John the Baptist or John the Baptizer. John went out into the wilderness and he preached a sermon of repentance and would continually preach that sermon. And those from Jerusalem and all the Judean countryside would come to the Jordan River to be baptized. And actually baptism is not something that just started with John. It was even before that time because uh, in the Jewish Faith that was one of the things as far as purification that they would have these things called mikvahs, which which is like kind of a ritual bath or a, a kind of a pit. And it was where it would have steps going down and you would take steps down into the mikvah. You would say your prayers, you would immerse yourself, and then you would go up a different set of stairs, kind of signifying that you went down unclean. But after you come up, you come up clean. And it gives us this beautiful picture of a purification. It was also used if someone from, was converting to Judaism, they would be baptized in a mikvah 
uh, or somewhere else to symbolize that they were drowning their old self and coming back anew. And so we recognize some of these things that, that we do as Christians that came from the Jewish faith. You know, for John the Baptist, when, when he was doing this in the wilderness, he had pulled out from a group called the Essenes. We, we kind of think that he probably lived with them at, for a time period. And this was a group of, of monks that had pulled away from Jerusalem probably 200, 300 years earlier and had gotten dissatisfied with what was going on at the temple there and had gone out into the wilderness to live close to the Dead Sea. And they lived in a place called Qumran. And in Qumran, you will find some of these mikvahs. There's about seven mikvahs that the archaeologists have uncovered there, and there may be more out there. But one of the things that these monks did was daily, they would step in the mikvah to purify themselves. And, and they may have done it more than once a day. But they would do that, and then they would come about, and they would go about doing God's work. And for them, that meant that they meticulously wrote on the scrolls, and they copied books. And they actually, now that we found the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, we have found almost all of the books in the Old Testament. There's just a few that are are missing. But they they did that at that time, and then actually... What is speculated is around 70 AD that they hid those scrolls in jars and put them in caves. And they weren't discovered until 1946. So all that time they were there. Now you may be wondering, why do I really care about the Essenes? And part of the reason is because John the Baptist probably spent time there. And it's a possibility that Jesus may have spent some time there. But we really expect or suspect that John the Baptist did because some of his teachings, his preaching about repentance and his interest in purification seems to come from there. And he went out to the Jordan River and was preaching uh, this uh, sermon of being baptized. Now, for those of us that are Christians, we recognize that some of, of what we do comes from the Jewish faith and then has carried on. And it particularly, you know, we have two main holy sacraments, the sacrament of, of holy baptism and the sacrament of holy communion. Now, as Protestants, we only celebrate those two because those are the two that we saw Jesus model for us. And John the Baptist was preaching a sermon of repentance and asking those who were sinners to come and be baptized. But yet Jesus came to John the Baptist to be, to be baptized. And, and when he did, of course, John was saying, you know, I'm the one that needs to be baptized by you, not you by me. But Jesus says, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this, to fulfill all righteousness. So it's as if Jesus was being baptized in a way to identify with us as sinners and to show us something that is so important that he wants us to continue. Just as as when he did Holy Communion and said, do this in remembrance of me, we do baptism in remembrance of Jesus. And when we look at Jesus' baptism, it's a beautiful picture of the Trinity because you see all three persons of the Trinity there Back to to Mark chapter 1 and verse 10, it says, As Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. So we have this beautiful picture of God the Father speaking to him and also the Spirit descending upon him. And when John the Baptist was baptizing people, he told them, I'm baptizing with water. But there's one who will come later who is greater than me who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. And since he said that and since we hear about the dove descending upon Jesus in the Holy Spirit, then we as Christians, one of our major beliefs is that when we are baptized... That we are filled with the Holy Spirit. That the Holy Spirit comes up on us. And so that means even more to us. 
Now, I will tell you that reading in Scripture, there are lots of different meanings that you can, you can find from Scripture that tie into baptism. You know, there is the idea of purification, the, the cleansing with the water, the initiation into something new, the dying to the old and being raised to something, something new. And so there's, there's all these different images and also the image of the Holy Spirit coming upon us. But we also read in scripture about who was baptized. And we read about individuals who decide to be baptized and they come forward. And we also see about entire households and families that are baptized, which is where some of the denominations, including ours, have infant baptism because we've seen in the Bible that that is done. Of course, for every denomination, they pull different things from the Bible and it's all all good. It's just looking at what different focuses are. And that's why we have different beliefs of, of how we do things. And as Jennifer explained, you know, in, in some denominations, they, they do it a little differently. Actually, that's one thing I love about being United Methodist is what, that we are a denomination that majors in the important things. So there are certain things that we've said, this is so important that we believe this. We believe in the Trinity God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We believe in the Holy Scripture. But when it comes to some other things that, you know, you could kind of read it one way or another way in the Bible, we say, okay, we're open. And so actually when it comes to baptism, in some cases we will immerse, which is dunking. We do that sometimes. Sometimes we will pour the water. If someone would like to have the water poured on them. And most often in our churches, because of our facilities and so forth, most often we sprinkle. But we can actually do any of those because we see all of those in Scripture. And it's the same thing with Holy Communion. You know, we're not dead set that it has to be you kneeling at the rail and, and getting a little cup and, and so forth. We, we do it in different ways. And so we're open on those things. We're also open as far as, you know, if someone, you know, as at an age where they can make the decision, says, I'm ready to accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, and I want to be baptized, then we invite them to. And that's called believer's baptism. But we also invite parents, if they want to bring their infant and have that child baptized, then they're welcome to. And it's, it's the parent making the vow for the child because the child's not old, to, old enough to. But when that parent makes that vow... What they are saying is that before God and before the church, that I'm vowing to raise this child in the church, that I'm going to teach them about Jesus Christ and to to guide them until the time when they come of age where they can on their own accept the baptism that was done for them. And often uh, for children, we'll do confirmation, usually about the about the age of sixth grade, we'll do a confirmation class. And confirmation class is just a time to go through the times of, of here's our doctrine that we believe in and here's the key points of our faith. And we teach those things. And then when we come to the end of it, then we ask the children and we would ask each child, you know, do you believe what you've just been taught? And for that child that was baptized as an infant... It's their opportunity to confirm their baptism and to say, you know, this was done for me as a child and I'm old enough now to confirm what was done for me. At the same time, if there's a child in the confirmation class that has never been baptized, then it's a chance for them to say, I believe what I've been taught and I'd like to accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior and be baptized. And there's some that say, I'm not ready yet. I'll wait till I get a little older and, and then I'll accept Jesus Christ. So, so there's some options there of, of how we do it. Now, I will tell you one thing that we do not do is that we do not rebaptize. And the reason we do not rebaptize is that even though you may come and say, hey, I was an infant and I, I don't remember being baptized or you know, even if I did remember being baptized, you know, I've sinned a lot since then. And so I need to be cleansed again and be rebaptized. 
the way we look at it is in your baptism, you, there, you are there and so is God. And God is big enough for both of you. You know, in the first sermon of this year, I t- we did a covenant service. And I, I taught you about making a covenant with God. And from Genesis 15, when God made a covenant with, with Abram and he had him split the animals. And then the, the blood was in the, in the pit. And, and God walked through. And it was only God that went through. It was God saying, I'm big enough to do it for both sides of the covenant. And so even if you don't remember your baptism, it's okay because God remembers it. And even if you were sinful, we have a God that forgives us and says, you're already mine. You know, when you were baptized the first time, I marked you as mine and you are still mine. And so it, we're all covered in it. So instead of being rebaptized, what we do is we either reaffirm our baptism or we remember our baptism. And actually, you'll have an opportunity, if you'd like to, today, for those of you who have been baptized before, to remember your baptism and remember what God has done for you. Now, I mentioned that we're looking at both baptism and temptation, but I'm just going to spend just a moment on Jesus' temptation. Jesus, immediately after he was baptized, the scripture tells us that he was sent out into the wilderness for 40 days where he was tempted. And we are all tempted at times. But we look at Jesus' life, and we see how he handled that temptation. And I'm, I'm not going to read it to you, but if you want to, you can go to Matthew chapter 4 or Luke chapter 4. And in both of those gospels, the first few verses talk about Jesus' temptation. And it tells you how he was tempted by Satan. But it also tells you how he responded. And he responded with scripture. And that's the best way for us to respond to is to to know scripture. That's one reason it's important to be reading the Bible, to to be studying it, to be memorizing scripture so that when those times come that we are tempted, we know how to resp- respond to Satan. You know, and you know, if the devil showed up and he was in the little red costume with the pitchfork and the little horns, we would recognize him. Unfortunately, that's not how he comes to us. It's normally that little voice behind us saying, it doesn't really matter. You can go ahead and do that. You know, he has a tendency to put temptation in front of us and and says, if this is just a little thing, go ahead. And I will tell you, you will be tempted. Jesus was tempted and it's not a sin to be tempted. It's a sin to give in to that temptation. But God has told us that, that when that temptation comes, that he is with us. In 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13, it says, No temptation has seized you except what is common to man, and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. So God is with us when we are tempted. I'll just tell you, there's so much more I would love to tell you about baptism and temptation and everything else. And so there's not time to do it today. So we'll save it for another day. Or I'll encourage you, come on Wednesday evening. When we do our Bible study, we'll be talking about this topic. And I'll be showing you some of the sites where where some of this went on in the Holy Land. And, And we'll get into deeper conversations. And I know some of the Sunday school classes today came out with some questions and some some deep things. So we'll, we'll dig into that a little bit further and you'll have a chance to ask those questions. But what I want you to remember today is if you have been baptized before, then I encourage you to remember your baptism. Remember what God has done for you. If you've never been baptized, then consider what God wants to give you because he wants to give you so much more. But if you're remembering your baptism, remember that God the Father spoke to Jesus and said, You are my son, whom I love, and I am well pleased. And then the Holy Spirit descended upon him. And know that as you remember your baptism, that he's saying the same thing to you. You are mine. You're my son. You're my daughter. You're my child. You're important. I love you and I'm well pleased in you. 
And as you remember your baptism, remember all that the Lord God Almighty has done for you.